And he basically tells him, listen, we just need to solve the murder. The mystery and murder. <laughs> that's, that's what just <laughs> happened right there. The murder. Hi, guys. And welcome to another episode of your favorite podcast, Unresolved Textual Tension. It is your three hosts today. Me, Maria, and... William, your ruggedly handsome co-host. Katie, the co-host from Christmas Past. Okay, and the book we're doing today is The Seven and a Half Deaths of... Evelyn Hardcastle. This is one of our Patreon live streams, and it was chosen by our patrons. So uh, their messages will show up in the lower third, most likely at some point. And this book is kind of interesting because it is very different than all of the other books we have done. Incredibly different. In what way? What do you mean? It's not a fantasy. It's a murder mystery. <laughs> it's basically Agatha Christie with some timey-wimey stuff. And I think this book is interesting because I think all three of us really liked it and then also had really big problems with it. And uh, that is what a lot of our patrons on our Discord also mentioned, is that like there are things that really work about this book and then there are things that do not. It is a weird mix um, of both and the stuff that's really good uh, it almost makes me mad the stuff that's bad because like why were we not on the same level like why were these things not like like how how could you do this and then fumble this so bad like what hip hop happened Stuart? yeah it is weird because like things like his descriptions are really great his atmosphere is great his dialogue is great his plotting is great and then like he just doesn't have a main character at the center of it, really. Or like there's sort of a blank space where the main character should be, I felt like, in terms of presence. And then some of the motivations, especially just straight up did not make sense. Um, and so it's one of these things where, yeah, Maria's right. He never lands the conceit of this book. There's, there's a fundamental thing that is the the heart of this book. Because there's two hearts. There's the murder mystery and then there's this other element. And this other element is, number one, what is it? <laughs> why why number two it feels like and i think one of our patrons and i can't remember it might have been Lindbergh, mentioned that like it the second part pulls away from the like murder mystery at the heart so much that it ruins the tension of the murder mystery at a couple points and you just you don't understand why like at the end it kind of Mm -hmm. tries to explain but that made it worse i'm gonna be making a comparison with um a movie called memento which is by um the guy the inception guy i'm blanking on his name and what happens is that it is told from the viewpoint of a character who has short-term memory loss christopher nolan shelby coming in clutch so what happens is that the movie is told from the end of the, like, there's a linear set of events. It's told at the end, and then it's told in reverse by 10-minute segments. So a 10-minute segment will happen, and at the end of that segment, we'll loop back to 20 minutes before that, where it'll play out till we reach the beginning of that segment. I just, this makes a lot more sense if you're watching the screen. Sorry, podcast listeners. Um, and it's told <laughs> like that. And what I, and the thing is that that movie works, the conceit of it, the form of it, really helps tell the story of this man who has, like, he has lost his wife and he is trying to find who killed her. But really, it's a, a book. It's a movie about purpose and about existentialism and like, what do things matter if we can't remember them? What is the purpose of life? What am I doing if I can't remember from one moment to next? And there is no linear set of events. There's no continuity. And I will argue that this book also has a complicated time thing going on in it. But the, the complicated time conceit that we'll get into actually hurts the story instead of helping the story. It always feels like the story is bucking up against the restraints of its form. And the author is talented enough that he's able to make it work within the constraints of the form, but the form, the constraints of the form don't help tell the story. And it's weird because there are ways in which the conceit add something a good murder mystery should happen where you get information in bits randomly and you don't realize you're getting bits of information and then it all comes together in the end and there are ways where as this book is going you're seeing the information come in or you realize because the main character goes that's that's important but he doesn't explain why and then it connects later because of the conceit of the story which we'll get to like there's a lot of moments like that that can make for engaging reading but then there's a lot of moments that detract tension wise that um, couch you in new characters and then as you're getting invested kind of in that character you're always reminded that it's not actually that like there's a bunch of little things but mainly mainly 
the ending. The ending, which we can't talk about till we get to the end, but wow, is it frustrating. The murder mystery reveal, bow tying, I enjoyed it so much. I wish this guy would just write a straight up murder mystery a la Agatha Christie, not Agatha Christie plus something else, which apparently is his thing. I was reading a blurb about another one of his books, but it was like Agatha Christie meets like... Just just give me a murder mystery, buddy. You obviously can do a good <laughs> job. <laughs> like, I want that. Guys in the chat who have read it, what did you think, general opinions, before we di- dive into, like, plot stuff? Well, they do that. Uh, Katie, what did you think of the book as a whole? It has the bones of a good story, but there is no salt and no, like, savory bits of it that really actually taste good at any one moment. Halfway through, it became a chore. It's just not... Fun. Yeah, I, I felt like that about halfway through, too. There's a thing that happens about a third of the way through the book, or probably like a little bit before that, that I felt like really sapped the tension from the story for the next two or three hours on double speed. So probably like about four or six hours on the, the audiobook. And I thought that was sort of a mistake where I was like, OK, this this time thing is not working. Jesse says halfway through it became a chore is my thought, too. So I get what they, the author was going for with it. And it was really well plotted out for what he was trying to do. But the expression of it became so... It's almost like a video game. Like, there were so many rules to it that it didn't have space to actually be felt, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. And also, funny with the video game thing is, like, I also kind of was like, oh, man, I should... I really wish we had this as a video game. There's a... There are a few games like it. Um, there's um, one of the expansions to Prey, uh, the new Prey, Prey 2, is uh, called Moonshot, where you will play through it as different characters and you can leave like equipment behind for different people or you can like open doors for them. And then there's one called like The Sexy Brutal or something. I don't remember what it's called, but it's a similar thing where you're playing through the same day over and over again as different people. Uh, on the one hand, I understand that like, oh, okay, this is a cool story. But on the other hand, like I was like, kind of like, oh, this almost would be better as a game. I saw said it dragged a lot. I loved the twist but hated the ending. Yeah, Jesse also said, I I didn't mind having the twist of having a time loop, but that twist just stopped being interesting quickly. We're going to have a big discussion because Jesse also talks about Ravencourt. Talks about what? Cecil Ravencourt. We are going to have a discussion. How in 2022 somebody let that be published in a book is amazing. Insane. Wait, what did I miss? The incredibly disgusting fat phobia. Like, why did he have to get described that way? It was so uncomfortable. Jesse said, when you're stuck in Ravencourt, I just want it out. And mul- like, it made me very uncomfortable. I kept waiting for some kind of a shoe to drop of like, oh, the narrator is like a terrible person and this is just his biases coming out. But it never does. It's just treated as like, no, being fat is super disgusting, guys. And I was like, I this is this is uncomfortable. OK, so the seven and a half deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle is uh, a mad mystery. And uh, it starts out with a premise. And then that pre- <laughs> like you think it's going to be one thing. And I was really here for what that one thing was. Because um, it starts out with a man in the middle of a fort. And I'm going to paint the beginning just to give you how different the rest of it is. But we are by no means going to walk through this entire plot at all. No way. It's not going to happen. Number one, I'm not that good. Do I remember all eight of the hosts' names? Yes. I was wondering how you would respond to that because I was like, if Maria's able to recount this earlier in the shower, I was just like, you know, casually bathing. And I thought to myself, I don't even know if she'll do it. I agree with you, Katie. I was thinking about Maria in the shower too. And I was like, oh, I don't know if she's going to be able to... I actually remember most of the names. I remember almost all the names of the people, um, which is very cool. And the thing is, I could probably walk through the plot. It would just take fucking forever. Like, it would Mm -hmm. just take so long. And there's a couple of small things that happen where I'm like, wait, how did that connection? Like, this is a book I definitely have to read twice to do a really solid job on a thing. But anyway, I just, you want to be here until like 12 o'clock at night? No, nobody does. And I would (laughs) die and we would all die. And my brain would turn to mush. No. So I shall paint the start. We open upon a man in a woods who doesn't know who he is, looks down upon his hands and sees they are old and wrinkly and goes, wow, that's weird. That doesn't feel like mine. He's screaming a name, Anna. And then he hears a woman screaming and he's like, that must be Anna. I'm going to run towards her. And then he's trying to get to her. She's screaming for help. And then he hears a gunshot. 
and he thinks, oh my God, she's dead. There's a murder. I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am, but there's a murder. And then a hand comes and slides something into his pocket and says, go east. And he takes it out and it's a compass. And the compass leads him east. And he's like, oh my God, did the murderer just slip me like a fucking compass? Like, am I going to listen to the murderer who just murdered whoever the fuck Anna is? I'm assuming I like her, but I don't actually know. He follows the compass east and gets to a decrepit old gothic little mansion. I don't think the mansion was actually gothic, but how decrepit and like... This is going to be the setting for most of the book, and it really is excellent. I should say just up front, Stuart Turton, or whatever his name is, he is really good at descriptions. They're kind of um, a little bit exaggerated in a way that's very... Uh, that really helps you picture it. And it um, this setting in particular, it's so run down and just mangy and it's it's great. Like there's this one description in particular that stands out to me that I thought to myself, oh, wow, is um, it's towards the end, actually. And it's when he's sneaking around in the underbrush of a forest. It's so damp that the qui- the twigs don't even have the, the oomph to crunch. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I knew- that, that- <laughs> There's a lot of anthropomorphizing in that way. That's really great. Yeah. And when I read that, I thought to myself, wow. Yeah, I like that. That's was- pretty good that was pretty good and it's interesting because this guy comes and there's a ton of people at this decaying mansion but the mansion has been like like a like a made up like like somebody has decided to slap some makeup on the old broad make her (laughs) presentable like there's paint things are trying to hide the cracks but there's people there like it's a celebration and he's like what the fuck he bursts in again not knowing who he is and he's like a woman has been murdered anna has been murdered people are looking at him like are you okay What's up? And then a man appears and goes, Belle, what are you doing out there in the rain? Blah, blah, blah. Everyone in this book talks like that. And the, yes. uh, <laughs> the narrator has so many great voices that are distinct for each character. Like it really helps you figure out what is going on. Even with the female, like I couldn't believe that there was a difference between Evelyn, who's one female character, and Anna, who's obviously another female character. I didn't hate them. I usually hate when male actors do female voices. I didn't. I was just like, oh. Julie Harper, uh, Stanwin's yeah. daughter, also had a very kind, warm voice. Like, this guy was excellent. Yeah, no, he really highly, was. Highly, highly recommend. Listen, the the audiobook is worth listening to, despite the things that I'm going to mention that I don't like. And again, I enjoyed this book. I read it voraciously. I didn't have a huge slump in the middle. There's a cat that's about to jump on my lap. And he has <laughs> <laughs> I listened to this in two uh, four-hour sittings, or five-hour sittings. I, like, I ate it up. I was choking on the last third. It was like that one episode of Ren and Stimpy that no one wants to remember where things are just being shoved down like someone's throat and you're just like, ah. The thing is that there is a point I felt like in the right after the first third that I felt lulled, but we'll get there. Oh, really quickly. Shelby says, I like that the Plague Doctor sounded muffled. Narration was immersive. And that was the best part. I thought that was such a great touch. There's even a point where the, 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 the Plague Doctor takes off the Plague Doctor mask and his voice sounds normal. It's so, like, such great touches. This guy really, top of his class. If Ooh, we should do best narrator for our one year. But it's easily going to be Anne Flosnick, the girl from <laughs> um, uh, Gideon the Ninth, and then this guy. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I would agree. This is just going to be what it is. So uh, th- this man comes and introduces himself as Daniel Coolridge, and he knows who our main character is, and he's like Sebastian Belly, but he calls him Belly. What? What are? What are you? What are you doing, buddy? And he's like saying, like, I don't remember who I am. I just saw someone get murdered, and Daniel gets concerned, takes him to his bedroom, uh, and starts talking to him. And what you discover is that this guy Sebastian Bell is a doctor he can't remember who he is and he was invited to Blackheath this decrepit old manor for a party and there is an air of the macabre around this party because 20 years ago to the day of this particular day one of the family so this this Blackheath is owned by the Hardcastles who have not lived in this house for 20 years because 20 years ago on this day their son Thomas was brutally murdered by Charles Carver, um, who worked for them and stabbed their son by the lake. And since then, they haven't 
they haven't really lived here. Every once in a while, someone comes back. And that's why it's in such disrepair. It has just fallen into ruin. The um, They were having a big party at the time. And so, like, in the middle of the big gala back then, they discovered this. And it just, like, their friend community basically was rocked because everyone was there when it happened. And he doesn't remember any of this. Our main character. He's got nothing. And he's trying to get through his day and piece together bits of himself. Yeah, and he's like, guys, this woman, Anna... She got killed. And everyone's like, we don't know who that is. Who is Anna? And he's like, is there no one who works here named Anna? And they're like, we'll ask around. And then eventually Michael Hardcastle shows up. He is the son of the family whose place we're in. And he's very jovial. He also knows Sebastian Bell, is familiar with him. But it's not until our main character, can you not eat my wire? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a thing. Yeah, you get out. It's not until Sebastian meets this character named Evelyn Hardcastle, uh, it's the daughter of the family, uh, that he begins to make the first kind of genuine connection of the day. Evelyn is kind to him and patient with him and hears him out and, and takes him seriously with his concern for Anna and ends up confessing to him when nobody else would what he does. He is basically a dope peddler. He sells laudanum and a bunch of other illicit drugs to rich people. And that's what he does. And so he originally thought when he found out that he was a doctor, that it was a noble profession, that he was like, a good guy. And then he's like, Oh, no, I was shitty. And he's like, I want to be better. The other thing that he is coming face to face with throughout the day is his cowardice. He's a regularly cowed by other people. He has the option to save Anna's life in the beginning, what he thinks is Anna's life, but he is paralyzed by fear, so he doesn't. Then he hears the gunshot, so he kind of blames himself. And there's multiple points where he is just cowed by other people and and timid. Can I just say also as a side note, does this really reads as a first novel in a series of novels? I don't know how they would do a sequel at all. I have no idea either, but it really sounds like one. It sounds like a, a, a trilogy. God, that would be fucking exhausting. <laughs> oh, would it ever? So at this point, I went in knowing it was a murder mystery and I thought, oh my god, this is so cool. We're going to have a murder mystery with an amnesiac old man doctor main character who wants to make himself a better man and who's going to help solve a murder mystery that's fucking cool i loved adrian bell so much because like he is a weak character sebastian bell sebastian bell so much because he is a weak character and he is kind of cowardly and there's the whole like who is his past at one point he's going to go into the forest and he's like okay, but if I go there and I remember things, will the be me I am now be wiped away? It's really interesting. Yeah. And unlike Maria, I didn't know there was some kind of a time loop thing going on in this book. I did not. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, cool. We're going to have an amnesiac doctor who over the time loop is going to figure out what's going on. Um, no. So the last thing that happens for Dale Sebastian Bell is he, so he's been trying to find this Anna person because he thinks she's dead. Then he gets a message from her saying, you know, meet me by the graveyard at this particular time. And uh, Evelyn Hardcastle, he ends up confessing everything to. And she's like, fuck yeah, let's go. <laughs> like, she's she's down for it. She's down. She meets him and she was just at the, the ball slash dinner. So she's in like a ball gown with like her coat on and a hat with her hair done up and yeah over two scenes he makes you like like evelyn so much as a character and you're like oh she's cool because she's kind of like tempestuous and like upper classy but also she's actually kind of really nice to him and she's like bored with what's going on and like it's a good contrast to another character we'll talk about in a little bit let me put it like that she has a, a black pistol she shows up and she's like gotta have protection and then they get there uh, to the place where they're supposed to meet man Anna and there's blood and they're like, oh no, what happened to Anna? And then like Sebastian passes out. And then he wakes up the next morning in a room he does not recognize. And this was the point where Maria and I both like fainted and had the vapors because we were so attached to Sebastian. I, was so attached. Well, I really liked him. I still like him. I still think it would be a better book if it was just him. I was so invested in his story. Number one, when do we get older characters? Like when do we get older like like in their 60s badass characters like and not even badass not badass but just when does that happen it would have so interesting anyway so what we discover is he's in a different fucking body and he's like trying to rush to the room that was his room to figure it out and he realizes he's in the butler's body he met the butler earlier in the day uh, and then he also met the butler later in the day after the butler had been beaten to death by this other guy. Nearly or to nearly, death. Nearly, nearly beaten to death by this other guy named Henry Gould. 
gold. And he's like, what's happening? And then he realizes it's the same day. He watches Sebastian Bell come in and like, somebody murdered Anna. And he's like, oh no, that's what happened yesterday. And that's when you realize that not only is this a time loop murder mystery, but it's a time loop murder mystery where a main character is popping into the body of eight other people. So this guy pops out of nowhere and he's the plague doctor. Which I thought was a little heavy handed. Yeah. Yeah, same. (laughs) <laughs> it's just like why but why a plague doctor like with the connotations of it in what way within the logic of the world why yeah it doesn't make any sense and there's no explanation i thought originally he was going to be like an angel and that's why or like death of some type which is somewhat true but also not true and so it's like yeah it does seem odd once you realize like no he's just uh, once we figure out what goes on later on the plague doctor pops out and explains You are stuck in this time loop. There is a mystery in Blackheath at 11 o'clock tonight. Evelyn, uh, or like 9 p.m., I don't know. At some point in the evening, Evelyn Hardcastle is going to be murdered. And he's like, no, not Evelyn. We were friends. Last I saw her, she was alive. She's going to be murdered, and you must solve her murder. You will have eight different days and eight hosts with which to see the events of the day with. And every day at 11 o'clock p.m., I will be waiting by a lake. And if you tell me who the murderer is and present me with enough evidence and I deem it correct, you shall be released from this prison. Um, yeah, it took me a long time to get into this. Jesse Losterpen says the time loop could have worked if he stayed the main character. I a thousand percent agree. If he actually was Sebastian Shepard or whatever the guy's name is, because I somehow have already forgotten Sebastian Bell. Bell. I have already forgotten. I think that would have worked so much better because part of the problem that we're going to find out is that this main character has no memories of any of his past and he has no memories of how many times he has gone through this time loop. So what happens is there's a... So to explain the rules a little bit more, he is stuck in a week-long time loop, right? And each of the days he will inhabit a different person. The him that was around as Sebastian Bell is now going to... will Could interact with the him that's the butler or the other characters. And at certain points he does interact with himself. It feels like the author picked the most complicated thing and was like this. I want to try to plot this into a story. And I get that. He actually does manage the plotting of it really well. It makes sense what each of the people is doing on the seven days and you see each of the threads slowly connecting. But to tell a satisfying story, I don't think this is it. I think he oh, he bit off more than he could chew. I think it would have been a much better story if we had stayed with Sebastian Bell and it had just been like a repeating time loop. Do you think it would have been better uh, a better story visually told? I don't know. I think there's a certain amount to which I feel like this would work a little bit better as a movie. Well, no, I was going to say because a- a- actors can bring a certain humanity to their characters and like ability, but th- he, switch- he would be switching actors, so I don't really think that would work. The problem is... Unless you explain the time loop and why there's eight different hosts and why he's stuck here and he has to solve it and he's competing against two other people in a way that feels satisfying, it will always fail. It is the fundamental problem with this. If you don't make that time loop and the conceit of the like thing work and feel valid and satisfying, you, you kind of want to... The other big problem, again, is that the main character has no backstory that he can remember. And because he is constantly switching bodies, his personality is constantly switching. So what we find is that each of the bodies has their own personality that sort of interacts with him and he will get certain... It's kind of like in a video game, he'll get certain like, yeah, certain different stat changes based off of which character he's in. So you get a really strong sense of who the people he's inhabiting are, but you don't ever get a strong sense for who he is because he is changeable and just by the nature of fiction if you don't have a history you don't really have a character characters are very much defined by their backstory and actions the other problem is you are let eventually you are told that adrian uh, the main character's actual name is adrian bishop and adrian bishop had a strong personality but he has been in this time loop so long he doesn't remember who Adrian Bishop is. He literally can't even remember his name and he has to be told by another character who happens to remember. Like his actual old personality comes in in these tiny little dial like like lines in the book it's like italicized and in the audio book it's this very hard clipped. Like you know when like it, it, it almost at first feels like intrusive thoughts. Like like I like he's he's thinking through something and then something will be like don't forget this thing. 
And that's kind of how the narrator spits it at you. And that's the the last remains of his original personality. But that guy feels very separate from the guy we're with. And the guy we're with is basically, hashtag, a good guy. <laughs> like, not that he <laughs> says that. That's his thing. He wants to help everyone. He wants to be the good boy. He, he likes other people who were good boys and girls. Yeah, that's one thing that I didn't get sold on was why was this iteration of him? Because as you are revealed uh, to the idea that there are many iterations of this guy as all the different time loops heap themselves upon themselves. And I just didn't really get why he... Like, granted, you know, you could argue, oh, why does there have to be an explanation for uh, a sudden irregularity in, like, a personality within a time loop? I mean, there's a lot of explanations you can come up from. But I didn't really understand why he was so special within his iterations and why he stood out, whereas so many other iterations of himself were very, like, arrogant or selfish slash (laughs) non-successful well what happens is that it's explained that with each continuation of the loop or each resetting of the loop he loses more of who he was originally his original personality and i think he he, like his his actual memories i think he begins to lose over time too because he must have early on had them for what we find out later but and the thing is this would actually have been even worse with a less talented writer, because this writer actually is good at making you feel like he's in his skin. 100%. It's a good, this guy is really good at writing a myriad of characters. Yeah, and you feel like you're in his skin. You root for him and that you want him to do well, but you aren't really engaged in what he's doing, I found. And that was one of my big problems in the middle third, where there's just sort of a slump where just plot is happening. And I'm like, I don't care about who this person is because they're not a person. They're just whoever's body they jumped into. I think, again, this is why as a game, actually, I'm going to make a strong argument that as a game, this would be a better book. Because in a video game, you're used to inhabiting a faceless character. I mean, again, the vi- the silent protagonist is no longer used as much, but for years and years and years, you just played just a cipher of a character and you are just the incoming experience. And that would not be a problem in a video game format. And there is a character that we're supposed to care about a lot, but we don't. And I'll, we'll get into that. But in a video game, somebody helping you through things endears you to the character so much. So for example, I'm going to talk about um, Half-Life. The Half-Life games, and specifically Episode 1 and 2, R.E.P. 3, we're never getting you. Um, In those games, if you listen to the designer's commentary, they'll talk about how, you know, the main character is a silent cipher, and through the second episode and the third, or first and second episodes, uh, you're helped by Alex Vance, right? And she is a character that kind of, she's like your wingman. She walks around with you, she shoots things. And what they found is that players disliked any time they had to help her and liked every single time she helped them. And so they eventually found that, like, you should not have to babysit her she should not she should say funny things every once in a while and it's because in a game you like people who help you and you don't like people who don't and so in a video game this other character we're going to talk about in a minute i think through the format of playing would have endeared her to you to endeared her to you so much more so i'm gonna go through the plot of this slash the rough outline of it let's go through um hard castle and up to where he talks with it's not adrian brody uh sh- the shepherd you remember the what the heck <laughs> Who's- which which hard castle i'm gonna cut this part no uh let's talk about oh, ravenwood Jesus. and then Raven- up to where he talks in oh, the God. library with the guy okay and then from there we can go into more general stuff because the plot does kind of make sense until that point he's in the butler the butler gets beat by this guy named gold who you find out later is an artist that was hired to touch up some family paintings why is he beating the butler nearly to death We don't know. You will know eventually. He then wakes up in another body. And when he wakes up, uh, he's in a nice lush four post bed, uh, younger body. He can feel the difference from Sebastian Bell and the butler. And he is in Daniel Davies' body. And the plague doctor's there and is like, listen, buddy, these are the rules of the game. You cannot leave, uh... Blackheath, you have to try solve the murder. If you fail, you will just restart this thing again. Do the thing. You 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 need to find out who killed Evelyn Hardcastle. Also, you're in competition with two other people who are here, but they're only in one body. And also, watch out for the footman. He says this to Sebastian Bell, uh, and Sebastian Bell gets a delivery from the footman, which was a, a dead rabbit in a bag with a letter being like, run, rabbit, run, rabbit. Uh, 
I don't know why that's the, like, anyway. <laughs> but that's what it said. Run, rabbit, run. He assumes the footman is one of the other people he's competing against. And he's like, you know what? Fuck you, plague doctor. I don't want to play by your rules. I'm leaving. I'm getting the fuck out. I'm going to the stables. And I'm leaving. And so Daniel Davies slash our main character, or our main character in Daniel Davies' body, puts on, like, a random assortment of clothing that is regularly throughout the rest of the book described as a rainbow, goes to the stables, wakes up the stable master at 3 a. M. <laughs> and is like, buddy, I need to leave. And they were like, well, I can't give you a horse right now, but I'll give you this car. And he's like, I don't know how to fucking drive a car. And the stable master's like, just put your foot here and go. And he gets in the car and he's going. And then all of a sudden, the plague doctor's in front of him and is like, you are wasting a goddamn host. You cannot leave. What are you doing? Because the stable master told him it's like an hour or two that way. Just drive in that direction. You'll be fine. And he's driving, and he's driving, and he's driving. And eventually, the car runs out of gas. He gets out of the car, and he starts walking. And he's walking, and he's walking, and he's walking. He passes out. He wakes up. He's in a different body. No, 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 no. What happens is first, before Maria has an aneurysm, and I agree because I also hated that, uh, he wakes up in the butler again. And what happens is anytime he falls asleep during the day in one of the other bodies, he'll wake up in the butler, who is basically just not doing well. He's like, he's been beat up. He's barely moving. But he, he's in um, a carriage being taken to the gatehouse. And he hears a female uh, character being like, it's going to be OK. I know who you are. It's going to be OK. We'll get there. Um, and we'll. Your name's Aiden, right? And we'll explain who she is uh, in a little bit. But then he wakes up in... Maria, why don't you Cecil explain? Cecil Ravencourt. My arguably favorite character. I kind of like Jim Rashton. I was into Jim. No, actually, yeah. No, I oh, would argue, yeah. I'm so much more yeah, invested like in Jim's him. story than actually anything else in the book. Him and his I uh, know, fiance. right? No! Right! <laughs> it was such a beautiful... Fu- oh my ah! God! Thank you! Thank you! <laughs> My boy, Jim, I was so mad at his ending. Like, I'm so glad that that's- I feel like the author fell in love with him a little bit <laughs> as he wrote him. It was so great. Anyway, anyway, before we get distracted, uh, let me s- describe something about Cecil Ravencourt. Uh, Cecil Ravencourt is a friend of the Hardcastle family. And he happens to be a rather large guy. Um, and instead of just being like, he was a big dude. He was like, pl- like- plus size uh the book bashes you over the head about how disgusting ravencourt is he smells he eats disgustingly he's ravenous every time food's around him he's like like there's a point where they're describing grease drip and i was so grossed out and so disgusted literally i have not been this angry with a description of a character like this since flipping saviors Sister. Jesse Lost Friends said he could have just been portly. I don't know why he had to be so morbidly obese. Yeah, that struck me too. It's not just like he's fat or he's large. He is like his mobility is impacted by how big he is. Even if he is, you don't have to describe it that way. No, I was about to say that. And it's not even that the narration describes it that way because it does. And it is so disgusted with him. It's that everyone else is also disgusted by it. Like he is disgusted by himself. He can feel his host's disgust. He can feel his butler's disgust. Everyone else is waiting to laugh at him. It's just bizarre. Can I be devil's advocate in this situation? I listened to this book at two times speed, but I feel like if I could have reread it, I would feel more confident in me saying this to know for sure. If there was a a particular reason why he was being portrayed this way, I would totally ride with it because there are certain things that this author obviously wants to get through viscerally as he switches through bodies. Why were the old people not described as like, pockmarked and disgusting like it just there's there's it's, they were no they weren't no. dance was just described as old and slow dance the third to last host dance it said his wrinkles like drooped so far and so horribly it was nowhere close to ravencourt's level of disgust one thing i will say about the descriptions is that yes this book does tend to have somewhat exaggerated descriptions for things like we said like you know the le- the twigs were so whatever they couldn't whatever right like there is an aspect to which certain things are exaggerated a little bit but even grading on that curve again the descriptions are so disgusting and it's it's not even just that they're disgusting. It's that the narration thinks they're disgusting. It's not like Ravencourt is the one who feels this way, but, 
you know, everybody else is actually like, oh, he's pretty chill. Or like uh, his butler thinks he's gross, but he's actually pretty content with his size. Like it's not, it's just everyone thinks he's super bad. And the, like, it's, yeah. There, there, it absolutely should be and is limitations to all of the characters. Dance moves really flipping slow. <laughs> um, he's an older guy. He gets tired quick. He falls asleep. He's too stubborn to have glasses, so he can't see anything. But it is not described at all to the level that it is with Ravencourt. And all you needed was to express that because he was bigger, he was hard to move. And that was the limitation. That is it. Why did we have to get him eating? Because here's the thing. If there was, Shelby said that there was a seven deadly sins parallel, which outside of him as gluttony, I did not pick up that much. You can in retrospect look at it, but like the grease dripping down his face as he ate like and and uh i think it was ice willow said this rich man who has grown up wealthy would have had better table manners especially if he has shame about his eating like it just i think the way this could have worked better is if you exercise all of the shameness of it but he's like a large man who is um morbidly obese and bells or uh, adrian starts the day being like oh, man my mobility is really impacted this sucks and then by the end of the day is like you know what he, my mobility is impacted but he was really smart i need to start thinking of my hosts as tools like because ravencourt is very is shown to be very smart and very calculating and there is a little bit of that towards the end of the book he's every once in a while like man i wish i could ravencourt's mind but there is such a judgment on how terrible ravencourt is that i i just i found it so uncomfortable to read when he's in ravencourt's body you do not appreciate ravencourt's mind at all. He is so focused. If there had been a specific reason why, like Katie was saying, I could have rolled with it. I just, I didn't see one and it made me very uncomfortable. The thing is, there is no bias for Adrian because Adrian has no prior beliefs. That's part of the problem. It feels fat phobic. That's it. It feels fat phobic and fat shamey. So like I Swallow said, and, and she's mentioned a couple times in the, the chat that you'll see on screen that she also is bigger. And she said, like, I'm so careful when eating around other people, and most fat people are. Living a fat body isn't horrible, though. It's not like horror unless the author thinks being fat is the worst thing ever. The author is not doing anything to enhance the story besides it feeling like he's fat phobic. Jesse said, the scene with the mountain of eggs just feels a bit like how everyone who comments on my weight seems to think I eat. It made me so uncomfortable to read, and there, there wasn't, like, a payoff for it. There are ways that he could have used this in a much more nuanced way. So like, for example, maybe like, so I do intermittent fasting right now. And one of the things I found about that is that it makes me a lot less dependent on food for my mood in terms of like, I don't need to eat to then feel good. And it also cut down on my like just snacking just to feel good. And so I would have liked something where maybe he like, you know, in Ravencourt's body, he eats and then he feels like a little bit better or something. That would have felt a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more like my host has different stats than other hosts, but not necessarily that it is gross. I like that. I like that alternate route. To comment on the lack of mobility being an issue for what he thinks he's trying to do on that day, that's fine. Dance has mobility issues. It is commented upon. It's fine to note those differences. Again, I just, ugh. As you can tell, we've spent this much time talking about it. We're gonna, we're just gonna, we're gonna close the chapter on this and just say, no, bad. Do better next time, buddy. Well, just, where was your editor? <laughs> where was your editor? But anyway, so when he wakes up in Ravencourt's body, he realizes, nah, I gotta play this game. I can't escape. I've, number one, got to figure out who is going to murder Evelyn, not to just solve the murder and get out, but he does not want Evelyn to die. He bonded with Evelyn as Sebastian fell. He's invested in saving her life. Aw, so nice. So he tries to do like adventurous stuff in the house, realizes that Ravenheart does not have that level of mobility. So he has to think about another way to like handle the situation. And what he decides is he goes to the library and he writes a note and he has Cunningham. Cunningham is his valet, um, who becomes a very important character. <laughs> um, he has Cunningham put a note into uh, an Encyclopedia Britannica on the shelf. And it basically says, hello, future selves. Please find this uh, and meet me in the library at this particular time. And let's talk and 
try help each other to solve some shit. Because at this point, he's still mostly trying to figure out how to break out of a plague doc. Like he views the plague doctor. Uh, he's not trying to solve the mystery yet. He's just trying to figure out what's going on with the plague doctor and if they can break out that way. And also how to keep Evelyn from being murdered, which is also not what the plague doctor told him to do. Um, and so he, the other thing he does is he tells Cunningham to go to the drawing room where there's going to at a specific time when an altercation is going to happen and the altercation is this girl named julie harper is going to say something to this guy named ted stanwin he's going to get really fucking angry uh yell at her it's going to cause a scene um and he sends cunningham there and he writes what's going to be said and like gives a blow by blow of the scene and this is to get cunningham to realize something funky is going on and that he needs to listen to him. Before Cunningham comes back, he wait, he, uh, <laughs> Ravencourt slash Adrian takes a nap, wakes up, and who should be there but Daniel Coolridge, the guy we met on the stairs with Daniel uh, Sebastian Bell. And he's like, hi, I'm your eighth host. This was a great plan. And he says something like, oh, man, the mind of Ravencourt, you're really going to appreciate that down the line. This was a plan only Ravencourt could have thought of. And he basically tells him, listen, we just need to solve the murdery. The mystery and murder. <laughs> that's that's what just happened right there. The murdery of Evelyn Hardcastle. And he's like, no, no, no. I want to save Evelyn. And and Daniel uh, is like, listen, we have tried multiple times, multiple ways to save her. She always ends up dying. No matter what we do, we just have to get out. And um, he's like, no, I'm, I'm going to try. <laughs> Jesse Losterpen says the murdery of Evelyn Hardcastle. There's the title. <laughs> that would actually be great. Oh, one other thing is that um, I've already for Shepard. What's his name? He was just talking to uh, the, his, his last host. Daniel um, Coolridge. Ah, yes. Daniel Coolridge. Um, he Shepherd. also tells him that, like, look, I can't tell you what's going to come because you might change events. And that's kind of a question that's left open is it can he change past events? Because when he interacts in the present, he's interacting with his past selves, like in terms of how they move through the world. And I didn't think this was a great aspect of the novel that's happened because it's that classic time travel like why don't we just change you know what happened in the past and then nobody actually does it and then later though it's shown that he can do it so again video game yeah i mean the problem with time travel is that fundamentally when you go back to change things you've already changed them like it's a the time is not actually linear it is a single point um but i didn't love how this would happen i think the book would be stronger if he just lived through the viewpoint of one character each day and like the other like he um the people he had been inhabiting the day before just went back to being themselves like it, like if it actually had been a week long loop where he was just each time the day the day restarts he gets yeah to be a different person i agree cuz it felt a bit like that thing that happens and there's a really interesting TV show that shouldn't have handled it this well. But every time you go back and change something, you're essentially just creating an alternate timeline. You, you've changed it. So you are now in and whatever was happening in that other one. And there almost gets to a point where he's like, what about the other versions of me who are in the other bodies? Are they going to get out? And the plate doctor's like, they're you. They're all going to get out. But like, <laughs> they had different experiences. Like his future selves did had different experiences than he did. Like there's a particular character that he greatly alters how they act on the last day and it fundamentally shifts some stuff to the point where how could what have happened before have happened yeah it, and and it, it, so it feels like alternate timeline kind of thing and then you're like but well, what happened to the other one that's the problem with time travel stuff is that that always happens it's always a problem i also think if he had been interacting with the normal minds of the other hosts, then you could have gotten like a cool thing where like he understands how to talk to this other person that maybe he didn't before he was in their skin. So you would have gotten more of like an ensemble piece in terms of the characters and you could have done some like cool stuff there, I think. He has the conversation with Cunningham, Ravencourt does, where Cunningham comes back and goes, why the heck did you know what happened in there? And he's like, I'm going to tell you something crazy. And he's like, what I just saw was crazy. And he's like, I'm not Cecil Ravencourt. My name is Aiden Bishop. And he doesn't know his last name yet, but he's like, my name's Aiden <laughs> and uh, I am stuck in Ravencourt's body and I'm living and there's going to be a murder of Evelyn Hardcastle and I need your help. You are now like my extra pair of eyes and ears and you need to do all the running around that I was going to do. And one of the things he tries to do, which connects to what we were just saying, is he wants Cunningham to interact with Sebastian Bell because as 
her the first day he lived through, he never met Cunningham. So if he can have Cunningham meet and interact with Sebastian Bell, that would could prove to him that he can change stuff. It ends up not working. So let's run through what important happens. Because again, there, there- I just saw Jesse's comment. She goes, so one of our patrons, Max, just came in a little bit ago. And he was like, can you repeat this whole thing? Um, uh, and then he went just messing. And Jesse goes, we will not discuss Ravencourt again. We will not talk about Cecil. No, no, no. Which it only makes sense if you've watched Encanto. We're, we're about to get to the important thing. Number one, he goes to dinner and finds out that Evelyn Hardcastle is going to be married to him, which he is like, he he's he finds out at dinner. Cunningham did not, despite knowing this, did not tell him to embarrass him. And this is why Evelyn is such a dick to him earlier, because he goes to try to talk to her and be like, you're going to be murdered. And she's like, fuck you. I don't want to talk to you. Um, but she also kind of acts like she knows she's going to be murdered, which is interesting. But at this point, we haven't seen the murder take place. Like, Aiden's been wasting uh, fucking hosts left, right, and center at this point. So we've never actually even <laughs> seen the murder. So we're four, we're fucking four hosts in, and it's finally fucking happening. Jesus. There's a, a ball, like at the dinner when it's announced, uh, he's super embarrassed because everybody's like, oh, she's going to have to marry Ravencourt. <laughs> How terrible. And like, oh man, it sucks. We've already suck. talked about that. Yeah, Avalyn runs out, and then. Later, there's a ball and like everybody's outside and Ravencourt is sitting by a window watching the outside and he sees Evelyn stumble outside and kind of walk to this like pond, like a viewing pond. She like goes into it and she just shoots herself in the stomach, like straights up. Oh, trigger warning, suicide. Will, you should put this earlier. Sorry. Uh, there might be, uh, for those of you who have issues with suicide, this is going to... It not actually be a suicide, but going to touch upon it. So be warned. Um, yeah, so straights up, like, shoots herself in the stomach. Her brother grabs her, is sobbing over her body. Uh, and he's like, oh, no, she was so upset that she was going to marry Ravencourt. And, and he also feels, like, the shame of Ravencourt in that moment, that she killed herself. And Ravencourt goes to bed, and then you wake up in a new body. And I'm not going to go through all the days of the other people. So a couple of things. One, I just forgot to mention this. But after that discussion with Adrian Brody in the library between... Daniel and Coolridge. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I felt like there was a real a real problem for the next like three or four bodies where I didn't really care what happened. Because we know by day eight, he still hasn't figured stuff out. He doesn't quite know what's going on. And it's like, okay, so we know that the next three or four bodies, nothing new can really happen and nothing is really going to get solved. And obviously in a murder mystery, you don't figure out who did the murder till the end of the book. But in terms of plausible, um, plausible suspension of disbelief, like we now know nothing is going to happen till like later in the book because nothing has happened. And so for me, that kind of killed the tension, though, again, the book is very well written. And unfortunately, that's actually not the case. He kind of knows way more before because like what you eventually realize is Daniel Coolridge is not actually his last host. And he discovers that like two hosts before his last host. Um, and so he is learning more stuff and you get to a point where you're like, wow, this guy seems to know more than Daniel Coolridge. But anyway, these are his hosts. Get ready. I'm going to run through them real quick. We're going to run through the rough outline of the plot. Well, we have to talk about Anna. First, we have to talk about, oh, look at us. <laughs> I was just about to say, first we had to talk about Anna. So we've mentioned Anna a couple of times. Sebastian Bell thinks she's dead. She pops out and she sends him a note and says like, meet me. We'll talk about stuff. Anna is one of the other people stuck in the time loop, but Anna and Adrian are working together. There is a sense when Adrian meets her, like sees her for the first time, he's overwhelmed by a sense of like friendliness, fond feelings, uh, friendship. Like this is someone he trusts. They, they do a hug. You don't get a lot of Anna really like you don't have a scene that is as impactful as the scene that Sebastian Bell has with Evelyn Hardcastle that scene is really good at setting up a kind of comfy camaraderie and also the motivation of why he wants to save Evelyn even though she doesn't I feel like that goes back a little bit when she's really bitchy to Ravencourt and the other ones but and the reason that scene with Evelyn Hardcastle works and these with Anna don't is because 
Evelyn Howard Castle and Sebastian Bell. Sebastian um, Sebastian were characters who we thought had a backstory, right? Even if we didn't really know that much about Sebastian's. So they were characters with a backstory interacting in a way that you got a good sense of their personality and they were doing things together. And when Anna and Adrian interact, it's two people without backstories because Anna does not remember anything before this point either. She remembers a little bit more than Adrian, but you just have sort of this nebulous feeling of like, companionship between them and the thing is the book will just continue to rely upon that for why they're in this struggle together because the thing is the plague doctor said only one of you guys can get out and so the whole time there's this tension of is she going to betray him or not because the plague doctor says she is going to betray you you cannot trust her stop trying to get her out with you and so there's that tension and uh anna will become a big motivating factor for adrian but the, there's no you can't have a friendship without any history like that's just in terms of fiction i don't know if that's true in real life but in terms of fiction unless we see them become friends right and this is why if she was like alex vance in a video game we would care a lot more because we would be like oh she's helping us all the time isn't that cool it's fun and that's the thing is anna shows up to be helpful at like key moments uh, like she'll pop in she'll do something helpful she'll pop out again and basically she's also being threatened by the footman and you discover that a version of adrian has told her that he is going to get them both out he is going to save both of them and she needs to trust him and help him otherwise he won't be able to get them both out and at multiple points earlier like it, it was obviously one of his last selves that said this um but earlier him is like yeah I, I don't see how we can do that i don't know how we're going to do that and so there's this pull of can he actually do it does she betray him because she finds out he can't actually help her and the other interesting thing is anna and the other character who at this point we think is the footman who is stuck in the time loop with him they only get one body and each day the day resets. So they remember a particular eight day loop. So the Anna that wakes up every morning is always the Anna that woke up on the first day until the entire loop restarts. And then she will remember what ha whatever happened at the end of the very last one, which is kind of weird and like timey-wimey things. Basically, the loop is every one day, but he gets to live through the loop eight times like it's a smaller loop within the bigger loop yeah like a gear and so like every morning one of his character the, the one of his characters has to go to anna and be like this is what we're doing get on it uh, and give her tips because you feel like anna knows a lot more than him at the start but then you realize no his, one of his future selves has just given her you need to be at this place at this time you need to do this thing at this time and like yada 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 and so it's really like why is it different and you eventually get an answer for why but at first it's just really weird and and you were faced with a question that he asks toward the end of the book where like how is that fair they get one day from one point of view and hers is literally a maid to try live through this uh and solve this mystery and he's got like eight eight chances to do eight different things in a more powerful people Again, she's a maid. Who the fuck is going to listen to her? Yeah, and so the plague doctor basically says, like, look, you chose to come here, whereas they had to come here, so you get certain advantages. And also, at one point, he's like, I'm kind of tilting the board in your favor, so I'm picking which host you get in which order, not on what time they wake up, which is how I did it at the beginning, because we've gone through this loop thousands of... Th this the loop thousands of times but um this time i picked it based off of like okay which one of you you know i didn't give you um raven court towards the end because by that point you need to be moving around a lot whereas at the beginning you can plan more um yeah. and so there are different rules and one of the things i don't like about the ending and the explanation of what's going on with the time loop is that they are literally just different arbitrary rules that the plague doctor chose there's no actual like metaphysical reason they have to be the way they are the rest of his hosts and the important things we learn with them his next host after ravencourt is a guy named jonathan darby jonathan darby is a rapist which is uncomfortable and he realizes at this point that darby has a temper and he gets angry like just in his room thinking he gets angry and he realizes oh shit uh, we have to, I have to rein this guy in. He 
he has his own urges, his own personality. Shelby said it's nitpicky and doesn't matter because there's so many characters and Will is adding a shepherd for no reason. But it's Aiden and Bishop, and you guys keep switching between calling him Adrian and Aiden. And Will keeps adding a shepherd. <laughs> and a, and a, someone else, Brody. Yeah, Adrian Brody. Jonathan Darby is a rapist. What we learn, uh, and Dar- Darby dies. Darby's the first person the footman gets. Um, I don't remember anything majorly important. Oh, Darby interacts with his mother, who is a character who ends up getting murdered and who adds to the thickening. I want you to look at Data real quick. Oh, you mean my demon? Yeah. My gremlin (laughs) over here? (laughs) I couldn't see that part because I have the chat up. That's so (laughs) funny. That's like a gargoyle. That's from Fantasia. Night on Bald Mountain. We meet Millicent Darby, and Millicent Darby is a friend of the family. We get more information about the happening. So, like, she knows about Ravencourt. She knows about this marriage. She knows, and this is the point that we learn, that the Hardcastles are broke AF. Uh, If the crumbling house didn't let you know it, she tells you now, and they are arranging the marriage with Ravencourt because he has promised to give them lots of money um, to do this. So the next body he wakes up in is a rich old guy who uh, is prideful. So I think if we were doing Seven Deadly Sins, this guy's pride. <laughs> he learns about the, like, Peter Hardcastle. Peter Hardcastle ends up dying by poisoning. We find out a lot of stuff about the Hardcastles and the actual murder that's going on. Dance is a grumpy old man. And he also, in Dance's body, discovers that the people that, the person that they think killed Thomas Hardcastle, the boy that started all of this, might not be who it is then the next person after grumpy dance and at this point at dance the important thing to note for the like aiden's plot is that dance is the first person that he starts getting memories of their former life like he can actually remember like there are points where he thinks dance thinks of his wife rebecca whose name i remember because of how often it comes up while in dance's body (laughs) um like there's a character that he sees and it reminds him of rebecca and then all of a sudden like aiden's like no 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 Get get your shit together, dance. We gotta we gotta do this. I do think those transitions were done well. It's very subtle. Uh, sometimes less so, but a lot of the times you just get caught up in the narration of it, and then all of a sudden Aiden's like, "Damn it!" It's interesting that over time he becomes more in his hosts um, exhibit more control, but it actually doesn't add anything to the story it doesn't at all yeah in terms of like his character growth because there isn't any it's not like by you know he's losing control and nothing is there's no real value added for that aspect of it um and so to me it felt a little bit like i don't know quite why we're going there besides adding kind of some tension of like he's increasingly not in control and then after dance is jim rashton who is hands down the <laughs> best character host. in the whole freaking thing. He's the best host in the f- sense that he's a cop. So he's really good. Uh, like there's a point where Aiden says uh, with Rashton, he was able to look at all the, cl- the clues as evidence rather than just as like, I have a piece and I have another piece. And he's just great. But what makes him great is his backstory. You learn about his love story with um, Grace Davies. I can't remember her name, but it's yeah. Grace Davies, who is one of our other hosts' sister. Like, they have this cute romance. He's a commoner cop, and uh, she's a high lady, and, like, his family. And they have, like, 100% trust in each other, and they don't doubt each other, and it's, like, the most healthy relationship ever. And she knows him. Like, they know, like, at one point, she's like, you got that wrinkle. I, I can see you're fixated on something. Can you tell me about it? And he's like, once I have all the pieces and I can actually tell you what's going on, I'll tell you. And she goes, well, go then. Go figure it out. Because you'll never, you won't stop thinking about it until you do. And I just love, it just speaks of, ah, they're so good. And they have such a cute romance. And then Jim Rashton. So uh, Darby is killed by the footman. Dance is killed by the footman. And then Jim Rashton is killed by the footman in a really, like, graphic way. And the thing is, I still care more about his story than Adrian's. Because that's Aiden. uh, Aiden, because that's the thing is, Aiden is not really a character, so it is really kind of hard to care about him, whereas um, Rashton is like a very... He he's a very tangible character with like a love story and like stakes in the and world. And friendships, like legitimate friendships, like oh, it's so nice. Anyway, um, and that's what I mean by the way when I say that the format of this book is not helping to tell the story. In Memento, the lack of understanding of quite what's going on and having to jump through and be in this constantly losing your memory um, experience of the format of the book mirrors that of or of the 
of the movie mirrors that of the character. And so at the end, when um, the main character has like a monologue where he's thinking about, do things actually even matter outside of my mind? What matters if I can't remember anything? You feel that like that ending of Memento is so powerful. I've watched it like three or four times and each time I get shivers. This doesn't have that because fundamentally this is not a, well, okay. Uh, the book does have Aiden um, question like, who is he? Who does he want to be? What what does he want if he can't remember things? Like it does have him think about that stuff, but it doesn't actually work because we don't know where he was. Like we fundamentally can't believe that he's forging his new identity if we don't know where he was from. Jim Rashton was great. Rick, Jim, I'm pretty sure your head was thrown at Donald or at uh, Dance's feet. Sucks to suck. To roll with it. Um, <laughs> by the time he's in Rashton's body, he's put together most of this. In Rashton's body, he's able to figure out like like part one of solving the murder, like the first big breakthrough. And then he gets put back in Daniel's Davies' body uh, because Davies finally wakes up. Uh, and then he solves like a next big thing in it. And then finally in gold, he solves the actual murder uh he makes anna solve it even though he did and we'll get there as to why i'm gonna run through two other plots so we, these are the different hosts N now now the actual plot number one <laughs> the mystery i will go through the initial premise and what the actual thing is 20 years ago thomas hardcastle was murdered on the lake his sister evelyn was supposed to be watching him while the adults were doing other stuff she was in charge of all of the kids she didn't want to be in charge of all the kids so she arranged a scavenger hunt for the kids to go do while she went horseback riding by herself in uh the lack of supervision uh, her brother Thomas is seen being stabbed to death by Charles Carver. It might be Thomas Carver, and I'm just going to call him Carver. Anyway, by Carver uh, on the lake. He was found by Ted Stanwin. Ted Stanwin is the gamekeeper of the Hardcastle Blackheath estate. He uh, shoots a gun. It doesn't hit Carver, but it hits whoever was with Carver. I, there's a lot of time spent looking for someone with a shoulder wound. It is Charlie Carver. Boom, boom, boom. Because he saved, uh, or he attempted to save Thomas and he captured Charlie Carver, the family elevates Stanwin to, um, they give him a plantation and he's able to elevate himself beyond uh, the position of a uh, servant. Now, the family from all, like what you're told initially, uh, Helena Hardcastle, Mama Hardcastle, never forgave Evelyn for, uh, you know, shirking her duties. And she blames Evelyn for her son's death, which is a really weird thing to put on like a 12 year old, but whatever. Um, and to get back at her, they are making her, they arrange this whole weird party uh, on the day of Thomas's death, 20 years later, to announce her marriage to Ravencourt. Now, Evelyn has been in Paris for the past 10 years. I guess it's been 10 years, 10 years, not 20. I lied. I've said 20 multiple times. It's 10. She's been in Paris for the past 10 years. This is, she's returning for the first time since then to Blackheath to be humiliated. Uh, and then the night of her, the thing, she shoots herself in the stomach. Now, here's what actually is happening. I'm not going to walk through how we find out all of this information because it's a joy and you should just experience it and let it happen. This is the book at its best. Mm -hmm. putting all of these pieces together. Now, there are a few places where it's a little shaky how point A gets to point C. Like, and, like it, you miss the step and then the character auto, like, explains afterwards. But, like, I don't love that with a murder mystery. And, like, I like to feel a little bit more involved. Um, but there's a couple places where it's a bit shaky. So there's a couple other things that is, gets mentioned multiple times. Number one, there was a stable boy that went missing a couple of weeks before Thomas's death. Uh, people tried looking into it but nobody like actually found anything about it. They just assume he went missing. His body was never found. Number two, uh, the horse stable guy saw Charlie Carver and another dude, or they were friends and they hung out that day. And Charlie was like, uh, he was being let go from the Hardcastle family. He uh, was mainly fine. He was getting drunk, but he wasn't like in a rage or anything. And the stable master doesn't think Charlie did it. And he has, um, he saw someone else there and he doesn't, so like, how could it have been Charlie? He doesn't think Charlie would have done it. 
that's something that needs to get explored. Evelyn, as a child, uh, was a psycho, and she murdered the stable boy by just leaving him to die in a cavern because she could. Um, and then what happened, though, is that her brother Thomas saw her. So she had to take care of him. So she murders him, but her mom uh, interrupts her. And the thing is that her mom and Carver had been having an affair. But basically, Carver is, and actually, Evelyn is also Carver's child. They're all Carver's Everyone child. Everyone is Carver's child. She um, murdered Thomas. Carver took the blame for it. And then sh they shoveled her off to Paris because she actually did murder Thomas. Her mom knows. No, her mom doesn't know. Her mom only knows like 10 years later, which is why she has set up this macabre thing. The first discovery is that Evelyn had been planning her suicide. She was planning it so she could get out of having to marry Ravencourt. Um, and then she was going to escape once people thought she was dead. But her brother Michael tries to actually kill her afterwards. What you find out is the first night when he's holding her while and crying over her body, fireworks went off, and he actually did shoot her to keep her dead. He then confesses, so uh, eventually somebody figures this out. Rashton places Darby in his way so that he can't get to her. Um, and he tries to kill his sister once she's in the like recovery room and like they think she's dead. And Rashton jumps out and is like, why are you trying to kill your sister, Michael? And he's like, because she'd actually have to marry Raven, blah, blah, blah. So you're like, ah, the murderer is Michael Hardcastle. Also, Michael's a fucking idiot. Um... Like, he's just an idiot throughout the whole oh, yeah. thing, in my okay, opinion. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense once you find out that Evelyn is an Evelyn. Like, and he was trying to tie up a loose end. That's, for... the, that's the next uh, big... Um... Well, no, the next big thing is that <laughs> you think Helena Hardcastle killed Thomas. So uh, we get a discovery where Jim Rashton talks to Ted Stanwin, the guy who apparently caught Charlie, Charlie Carver. And he was like, what did you see, Ted? Uh, and Stanwin's like, Helena was standing over the boy's body saying it was an accident. It was an accident. And and they've been paying me money. And that's actually how I got the plantation. And I've been blackmailing them ever since with this information. And Charlie was my friend, but he loved her. So he took the fall. So this character that you thought was shitty this entire book, you were like, wow, Charlie Carver actually like took a fall for Helena. That was really great. Also, fuck you, Helena, for letting that man take the fall for you and die, even though he was innocent. That sucks. And so that's what you think happened. Helena killed her son. And then uh, we get the actual explanation, which is, you know, it was Evelyn. And Evelyn was Charlie and Helena's child. So Charlie took the fall. He didn't want to watch his daughter get killed. Um, or no, they think it was an accident. Uh, the way she plays it off and uh, they come upon her like as it's happening and Helena automatically assumes that they were play fighting and it happened. So they, she, uh, Evelyn explains like, yeah, no, they just auto filled the story for me. And I just went with it. And it wasn't until years later when Helena discovers a clue that lets her know, Oh no, my daughter was a psycho murderer. That, that sucks. Uh, and they discover all of this when they find the murdered body of Helena Hardcastle stabbed with the same knife in the boathouse. And then the real Evelyn shows up and she has been, Madeline, like, the French maid Madeline, I forgot her last name, but Evelyn Hardcastle has been pretending to be a maid. The girl who is being Evelyn Hardcastle is a lady named Felicity Maddox, who's a con woman who they hired to pretend to kill herself so Evelyn could go off free. Michael was supposed to actually kill Felicity so that Felicity wouldn't be able to blackmail them or complain about it afterwards. And Evelyn basically confesses she killed the stable boy, she killed Thomas, her parents autofilled, then her parents found out so she knew she had to deal with them. And she's just like crazy psycho murder. And let me tell you, this scene is chilling. When Evelyn pops up as the, and you're like, oh shit, it was so creepy. This was such a great moment. Evelyn felt so vile, but she loved her brother. Like there's this moment, like Michael ends up dying because he drank the poison that real Evelyn put in fake Evelyn's glass. And she is genuinely cut up about it. I felt like it was a bit of a, it's a little bit of a cop out to just have one of the characters be an open sociopath, but it is pretty chilling. And especially by that point in the book, it comes together so cleverly that you're like, okay, this is, this works pretty well to, to wrap up this. But here's the thing. This whole thing we explained has nothing to do with what's going on with the time loop 
loop and Aiden and Anna. The other thing that's happening. So you discover that there's a bunch of time loops everywhere and they're little like rehabilitation centers. They're like prisons, creepy time loop murder mystery prisons. And if you were a heckin' bad person, you got sent to one of these. And Blackheath was only for the most terrible and bad people. Like of all the criminals in the world, only two were actually sent here. And it was Anna and the guy who's in Daniel Coolridge's body, because something else that happened that we haven't explained, but Daniel Coolridge is actually the third person. He's not one of, like, and he's a dick. He's a raving dick. The footman was just a normal crazy person. So (laughs) Jesse says rehab centers where you relive trauma to get better sounds legit. I don't. (laughs) And, like, how you get out is that you solve a murder, but, like, you can solve a murder by being a dick. So I don't understand how that's rehabilitation. The way he explains it is that by stripping away their memories, they're, like, letting them that that reveals the truth of who they are which is stupid because again like cool ridge like almost figured it out and he was an awful person the whole time so it doesn't really make any sense uh, like it, and the other problem is that none of this has to do again it, well okay so none of the time loop stuff has to do with the murder box stuff it's literally like play a game of clue to figure it out and the problem is that i really wanted it to be tied in somehow to the actual characters i wanted him to be someone like i thought he was related to the family like i thought aiden was somehow involved in this that because aiden comments multiple times that he has he regularly feels this extreme sadness in relation to a certain woman that he can't remember. Um, And I'm like, is it someone who is involved in this? Is that why he's here? Are these people like, do they need to solve it for themselves? Is Anna actually Evelyn Hardcastle? Like, like I had all these series of how these things intersected. Was uh, Aiden like Thomas the whole time? Like, you know, the soul of Thomas coming back to try to help his sister or something that's cliche, but it at least would have tied in somehow. It would have been so good. I would have like, as cliche as it would have been, I would have liked that better than what it is so anyway back to prison times anna was actually someone named annabelle culper and she was a heckin bad person like and and we're never actually told (laughs) like it's really weird how we're told because she was essentially like a terrorist but also the problem is that this whole thing has taken place in like a post world war one edwardian i don't forget what the time period is called time period and then at some point you get the sense that actually no the events are happening sometime in the future and this is just the time that they're going back to check on it's never really explained it's like it it's not like that black mirror episode where like they kind of explain the person having to relive through being hunted each time it's literally just like hand wave magic we're doing this somehow we don't know if it's magic or sci-fi stuff and it it's really weak and i just did not like any of it what happened in the book no longer mattered to me once i hit the point where he was walking down the road as uh daniel davies yeah thank you um and he was coming back and he was going to you know try to figure more things out goes to the graveyard big things happen pretty much essentially the third three-fourths through the book um towards the last leg i just was like That's why I say if it was a trilogy, it would have been better. It's because there's this whole pretend setup in the background that is not explained at all. And it's utilized in such a fashion that without it being explained, it's like, okay, so what? Is there a bigger story? Which which percent setup? The idea that the um, plague doctor, I mean, Silver Tear. Yeah, we have a character gonna, named Silver I'm gonna, Tear, I'm gonna, which is a. Joseph. Yeah, I know. I hated this. We have another character that seems to be like a pretty big player. Um, seems pretty important, given a lot of description and time um, dedicated to this character's introduction. And the character does absolutely nothing. Um, literally, actually does nothing. I could tell this whole plot and never mention her. Yes, uh, <laughs> she is completely forgettable. And the problem here is, is that it seems like there is a bigger plot with heavier stakes at foot. 
And that's why I say it would work as a trilogy, even though I would not want to read the second and third book if it was written exactly the same way, which it couldn't be. It's because this is a very unique situation. If it was told from the point of view of the player and he had to yes. live with the yes. consequences and yes. he finally found out the organization that was holding everything. That's what I was picturing. That's what I was like. I was actually genuinely thinking, is there going to be like another book to this that I just haven't looked up or anything? It's because the way it is, there's like this really epic background. There's this society of people, whether it's supernatural or just super futuristic or something else in between that's happening where these are plague doctor person and another person are part that also wears a plague doctor outfit are part of an organization that are not mentioned otherwise that seemingly have control of these very special places where essentially it's purgatory and they watch damned souls go through the process of attempting to learn from their mistakes even though it makes no sense as uh uh who was it that said it jesse's like oh yeah torturing people with their trauma to get over their trauma great job yeah what is the purpose of mentioning any of this yep. if it is not going to be utilized yep. and so instead of it being like a magical mystical like third party person instead it becomes like this overarching enemy of some sort but then it's never used and what's the point and it's like okay and it comes in right at the end like Katie's really right and this is the fundamental like this is one of the worst things about this book Here's what it is. Like I said, there's these rehab centers. And apparently there is this organization that runs these time loops for the heckin' bad people that got sent there. And there are rules and each uh, time loop has their, like, official person that's working. It kind of gave me, have you guys watched Umbrella Academy? Have you watched Umbrella Academy? It gave me the vibes of the time people. That organization that is in control of keeping the time uh, timeline in check. I think Jesse, who was it? Somebody said uh, the this book would have been better if the plague doctor had been a cat. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Add <laughs> some Max's. sort of. Uh, yeah, I would have preferred it so much if it had just been actual purgatory, which is what I thought it was originally. And it just ended up being worse purgatory. I'm still team. I wish Aiden had been Thomas's. Like, like trying to avenge his... Well, at what point did that occur to you that you thought that maybe that had been part of the plot? No, it, I didn't think that's what it was. I wished. There was a point where I was reading it where... Like, so there was a point where I thought he, uh, Aiden before we knew Aiden was completely unrelated to any of these people, where I thought he was, like, maybe he was the relative of someone, or he had been one of Evelyn's lovers, or, like, that he was just involved, that there was some personal investment that he could no longer remember for the story, and, and then, like, the idea of having it be Thomas. Like, Thomas gets the chance to live a, a scotch. Yeah, I would have preferred that. So, there's the weird organization, and they created Blackheath, and Blackheath is the worst time loop. Nobody's ever solved it. Two people went in. But Aiden Bishop elected to come in because... Annabelle Culper, the baddie McBad Bad, tortured publicly and murdered his sister, whom he loved. And he was not, he thought, an existence at Blackleaf. So this, this, this <laughs> enters this thing where that society knows that this is what prison is. It implies that society as a whole knows when criminals get caught, they get sent to weird time loops. And that's why I said futuristic, weird, dystopian stuff. What the heck? <laughs> and like, like the thing is, you don't know. It could be weird, futuristic, dystopian, and they just picked this murder. But like, there's this point where at the end where they just get to walk off the premises and they're out of the time loop. So like, does Blackheath still exist? Where are these people? Are these like holograms? Like, I is Rashton still dead? That's what I want to know. That's what I want to know. I know. I was thinking the same thing. No, the weird way I conceptualized it was it was kind of like essentially a... Uh, I don't know. It's too supernaturally for it to be pure scientific. This is a cool concept and executed correctly without all the information. You don't have to have all the information in order to enjoy it. But it was such a key part of the like plot with it being such a core part of our main character who's supposed to be from outside of the situation. Like it's like, OK, well, let's oh, wait. again, trilogy. Aiden elected to come here that's why he gets to do the other stuff and what you discover is that the plague doctor has been trying to get Aiden out an innocent man elected to come in specifically to torture the fuck out of Annabelle Culper which is why he's a good man that's why the plague doctor likes him so much well the plague doctor feels like this was a mismanagement on the part of his superior like this is not what the, the this is not the job of the time loop and he's very much like he believes in this system so he's like this this disorder in the system needs to go he's been trying to help like especially 
as Aiden began to forget who he was and began to forget. And what you get is the idea that Aiden forgetting himself over all the time loops restarting and forgetting his memory. Eventually he gets to a place where him and Anna, who forgets that she's Annabelle and just becomes Anna, become kind of different people and are bonding in these different time loops. Not always. In the previous time loop, he killed her. (laughs) At the end of it. <laughs> we don't know why, but she remembers it and she's heck, uh, heckin' angry. Um, and he has to convince her to work with him somehow. This could have been so much more meaningful if we had more uh, narration from before his newly turned saintful self became a thing. Or if we had some scenes from Anna's point of view. You don't say! The problem is, it's a really engaging idea and cool to have this idea of them slowly becoming friends over these time loops as sometimes they kill each other and sometimes they don't and sometimes they work together and sometimes they don't we don't get to see any of that story we just get told that that happened it's not like suddenly this unleashes a flood of memories in him where he remembers all these times they've worked together or all the horrible things he has done to her or how over time this has changed them like that does not happen it's still just an informed like okay, well, that's a cool idea, but all we know about you and Anna is this time loop and this nebulous idea that you guys know each other. And, like, the thing is, I liked Anna more than Maria because I just like vivacious, young, pretty women characters. No, I thought Anna was a stellar character. She's fun. But, like, she does not have as much personality as Evelyn because Evelyn actually has a personality and history. Or even Lucy Harper, Stan Wynn's daughter that you discover. Like she has such a great scene with Ravencourt where she defends Stan Wynn despite the fact that he was a dick to her. Like, and it's such a sweet scene and she's like the only character that treats Ravencourt like semi-decently. So hashtag Lucy. And this will become important because this now is... Aiden's um, driving motivation is that he is going to get Anna out. And the reason you discover all of this stuff about everything that's happening is because he's getting really close to saving Anna. He is including her. They're getting close to discovering the mystery. He's going to give Anna the information. And that's why Silvertear gets involved. Silvertear is another person that works for this organization that runs the weird time loopies. And he's she's like... Normal plague doctor, you have given Aiden too much help. He's using it to help Anna. We cannot have Anna escape. And Aiden's like, what the fuck is happening? What is this? Like, they're too close. We can't have Anna get out. And he's like, just think, get the fuck out of here. This isn't your loop. Go away. And what you discover is because Anna Bell Culper was such a baddie McBad bad, unexplained. If you're going to say she's a baddie McBad bad, <laughs> at least, like, was she working for a terrorist organization? They don't actually say that. They just say she was a group of I people. I was literally picturing her as kissing Kate Barlow. That's kind of the feeling you get, but it's like, it's very undefined. I mean, I don't know. I I, I get that, like, her torturing his sister to death, it does make you go like, okay, she's not a good person, but it still feels nebulous because again, it, the setting itself actually feels nebulous at this point because we don't know what the world outside Heathcliff is like. And was she just doing stuff to be bad or was she fighting for a cause? Like, cause most terrorist organizations are fighting for a cause that they think is right. And we get none of that. It's just this weird, like she was the leader of a bad group of people that caused chaos in a lot of places. Like that's it. That's what you get. And then you get his specific like Aiden's specific connection to her. So uh, he's getting close and eventually him and the plague doctor have a conversation where he's like, listen, you can't save Anna. She killed your sister. Aiden is flooded with memories. And he's like, but Anna's my friend now. What do I do? And then the voice in his head that is the, what is left of the first version of himself goes, Annabelle Culper is dead. Anna is not Annabelle Culper. He's like, oh, you're right. And then he was like, plague doctor, your weird rehabilitation thing worked. (laughs) Anna is no longer Annabelle Culper. You did it. You rehabilitated her. And he was like, I don't know why you're saying that. Uh, And he's basically like, listen, if I can prove to you that she's changed and I can get her to solve, because basically what he discovers is he discovered uh, Michael was the murderer, but he's like, but Michael's not actually the murderer. There's something else happening here that's all connected. That's a missing piece that we don't have. And so if Anna can give you that part of it, then we both will solve it. And then we both should be able to get out. And then he's like, maybe I guess so. Well, you can try convince me later tonight. And so his entire last day is built around trying to help Anna, but also now knowing that Anna was bad. So there's moments where he's like, is she going to betray me? Is she worth? And then again, the voice in his head is like, Annabelle Culpa is dead. And you're like, you should not be questioning this. If this is your motivation, like you should just be going gun. So it's really, 
I don't love it. I don't like it. <laughs> the scene where they discover Evelyn is the murderer uh, was the like is alive and she's not actually dead, but it makes it makes an interesting problem where Evelyn Hardcastle didn't actually die. She's alive. Like the plague doctor's there and uh, Evelyn's alive. And it's like, who killed Evelyn Hardcastle? She's, she's alive. You can't, you can't give an answer. And Anna is going to sacrifice herself. She is going to murder Evelyn so that Aiden can leave. And that's her big grand moment. But then at that moment, Felicity Maddox, who was poisoned by uh, Evelyn busts in with like a gun uh, the gun that uh, it was supposed to be used to actually kill her and shoots Evelyn dead. And so then Anna's like, it was Felicity Maddox. Congratulations. And then the plague doctor's like, okay, guys, you just need to run. Before my supervisors find out what happened, you just, you need to run off the property. I'm not going to give you your memories back because the odds of you getting caught will be so much higher then. So just get the fuck out of here. And so you end this story. <laughs> you don't get any closure about what actually happened. Is Jim Rashton alive? Did he? We won't <laughs> know. Did he die? According to the play doctor, all the characters are all, like, I got the sense that they're already dead. It sounds like that, but like, what was the actual fallout? Like, like. I just, I hate that we don't get anything out of it. And Evelyn, Evelyn Hardcastle, that's not actually who killed Evelyn Hardcastle. Like, she got away with it. <sighs> yeah. She yeah, got and, away with yeah. the murder. <laughs> and they've been in this loop for 30 years, they mentioned. 30 so years. So even whenever this happened, this is 30 years before they went in to do this job or whatever yeah i just like it so much as an ending the more i think about it like it and again no <laughs> i just didn't like it guys I, just, I don't like it i think it fumbles it bad i think again this is like where the author can't he's been juggling all these plates of the time loop stuff and then some of the basic questions just like smack him in the face as he's trying to do that and the basic concept hurts and it's because it's uh, a couple of people have mentioned this concept over substance or high concept poor execution and this is entirely it we learn nothing more about aiden other the only thing we get we get about his life which he has now happily sacrificed and he's not going to go back to were you married were you dating someone were you gay like we got nothing about this man. And he goes, I don't need any of those memories now. I'm just, me and Anna, I'm just going to go do a heck and run and leave all of that behind. And it's just so weird because it's not like him consciously, it's not like he learns his memories and then says, I actually want you to take them from me. These do me no good. It's even conceptually interesting to have it be that like he has destroyed his life in trying to torture Anna and then together they have like they are now the only thing that matters to the other. Like that's conceptually interesting, but it does not work because we did not see that happen with Anna. We just saw the very end of the loop when they're already chummy. It's a problem where this amnesic thing really hurts the story's ability to make you care about the characters and specifically his motivation to give all of this up for Anna to get her out and then to just live on their own. Now that we've expressed our dislike, I want to read through some of our um, like, so I had one of our pa uh, our patrons in our Celestalin. Okay. First, she says, I feel like Anna being this big, horrible person was such a cop out to explain why they're in purgatory hell. Wouldn't it have been better for her to be bad like everybody else? Not super bad specifically. I feel like a tweak could have made Aiden and Anna, a uh, tweak that could have been made where Aiden and Anna were married, then maybe Anna killed their child or something, perhaps uh, PPD related. Uh, Aiden, uh, while hurt, for uh, for what she did still wants to save her, then there could have been some fleeting memories to make us realize their relationship. This is the largest problem with the book, I think. She's she's right. Their relationship is one of the biggest problems. I think downgrading um, Anna from super villain to just normal villain, I think actually makes a lot of sense too. In that, it, Well, there's no purpose to the super villain exactly. status. Exactly. And the thing is, it then makes it more like, okay, he's trying to get her out of an unjust system where it's not, like, that's the thing is like, theoretically speaking, being tortured forever for being a mass terrorist or whatever is bad but like it becomes less of a it, it's easier to rationalize he just wants to get her out of this broken system where she's going to be punished forever for a finite crime essentially if she wasn't a super villain but just like somebody who did a bad thing and then uh did darby have to be a rapist and didn't he do something with madeline like i'm not really sure what that added to the plot other than that every character seemed to be despicable in some way look i have no problem with that like I don't want to say representation to have it taken like the wrong way. I don't mind having an evil character in a plot. I don't mind having a character that has disgusting 
uh, habits. I will say that in general, it kind of reminded me of Ravencourt a little bit and that this is the broadest representation of that kind of a stereotype and that he's not just like a rapist. He's like a super creepy stalker one who smells people's clothing. Whereas like maybe a little more nuance in terms of like, and yet- you know, he still was described less creepy and disgustingly than Ravencourt. Lastly, the plague doctor. I don't know how I felt about him being an actual person at the end. I liked him better as some higher being. I also kind of hoped it would turn out that Aiden was the plague doctor or something like that. I also kind of thought that was a potential way. I thought for the longest time that, or I didn't think, but I was like, oh, one possibility is that Aiden is the footman somehow like deranged and in another time loop or something like that. That would have been cool. Anyway, um, and then there were some other really good... Uh, things that our people said that I'm, I'm just going to read really quick because they were so great. And like Lindbergh's not here to say any of the... They had a good breakdown, yeah. They said, this is probably just a me thing, but the quote in the blurb saying, this was a dash of Agatha Christie blended with X and Y probably affected my ability to appreciate this book. I did not appreciate the way the two mysteries competed with one another. Con- and the two mysteries, what is happening with the time loop and the actual murder mystery it competed with each other constantly shifting the narrative focus back and forth between the two the experience might have been better for me with a different protagonist because i felt trapped in aiden and that was a lot of the first person narrative was wasted on navel gazing while simultaneously providing almost no satisfying character development because of the head hopping we essentially left off with the main character being a blank slate although i still think that from what i could make out from the vast amounts of inner monologue he was a right tit if the MC had been more focused and the inner monologue more reflective than I, me, my, and judgmental, I think I would have been much more invested in what was happening to Aiden. When the plague doctor thought Aiden had solved the murder, he said Aiden would be released whenever he next slept, which implied this world was a construction of some sort, like a mental prison, I thought. I mean, they're not even in their original bodies. And after Anna reveals who murdered Evelyn, they just walk away into the night. So this was the real world. <laughs> Also, since the person who murdered Evelyn only could do so because of their interference, does that mean this wasn't a real murder case at all? So technically, Felicity Maddox was murdered and everybody thought it was a love Evelyn Hardcastle. So there was an actual unsolved murder, I think. Um, at one point, they mentioned one of Aiden's hosts had fought in the war, which I took to be World War I based off surroundings, technology, clothes and all that. But then it makes little sense for there to be this kind of technology, which would be required to recreate re- re- uh, to create an entirely fake reproduction of an old murder or transfer consciousness between hosts. All of this I could have accepted, though, if I hadn't been subjected to the massive cop-out of just not showing any of it at the end. Also, like you all say, the friendship or whatever between Aiden and Anna feels really pieced together and unlikely because their current selves just met. The author tried to lend credence to it by sprinkling hints of them retaining memories and feelings of each other throughout the story, but I don't believe those feelings would overshadow Aiden's hatred, especially after he had that flashback remembering his sister and Anna's experience of being tortured and murdered by Aiden for 30 years. Honestly, I questioned the decision to pair them off, and I can't suspend my disbelief that far. The answer to who murdered Evelyn was plausible and entertaining to discover. I thought that bit was rather well executed, and several of Aiden's hosts were interesting people on their own and I think that is a really fantastic take on the book and Mm -hmm. a lot it basically says a lot of what we said um and a lot of people like there's so many good in our like guys join join like (laughs) so much oh you can't see it you can kind of see like so much discussion about this book happened between our patrons in our discord I read this book a little bit late and the thing is that I finished it and I was like all right I'm going through I can go to the spoiler thread and I can finally click on all those black boxes to figure out what everyone thought it was like the most satisfying thing because you get to go through and see everyone's reaction and that was just like a ton of fun Ice Willow said another funny thing in the discord I'm gonna say this Ice Willow because you're not saying it now but it was funny she goes I thought the escape was fine I just hated that he decided to give up his whole life he apparently has outside Blackheath for a girl he's only known for eight days hysterical he's a very talented writer he does the plotting well but there are certain fundamental issues that he can't get past just the murder the actual if this book had just been solving the murder of evelyn hardcastle with a weird like an interesting not because you know like a lot of murder mysteries it's that the detective dude like um agatha christie has that one guy she uses a lot there's always that like the guy and i liked the idea of if it had just been sebastian bell stumbling through discovering all of this stuff putting it together and having like through his helplessness like having people help him and accidentally help him solve like 
again, the actual murder mystery, Evelyn, Cat, like the what happens at Blackheath, fantastic. I loved that twist. I loved it. I loved how like all the hard castles were dying, but half the people didn't realize it. Like a lot of the plot didn't even know, like a lot of the characters didn't know Peter Hardcastle had been murdered. <laughs> like it just didn't come up. Some characters lived the entire day without knowing how, I mean, nobody knew Helena had been murdered until the end, but like nobody knew Michael had been murdered. Like it was just so interesting. All the stuff outside of that. Me. Jesse, to answer your question now. So Jesse asks, if the detail of the time loop was given earlier so it was an established part of the world, would the story be better? I don't think so for me because I think for me, the disconnect between it just being like a game and the actual mystery of what's going on, like the disconnect between the time loop and the actual murder to me is just really a weakness of the book. And so even if I went in knowing the two were separate, I still, it's hard to care it's hard to care about one or the other when the other exists. I would recommend reading this book just to go through the like fantastic little crumbsies and finding because like we spoiled it as far as like who the murderer is. Sorry, but how it comes together is really interesting. If you just ignore the other stuff, <laughs> like you'll get frustrated by it, but the other stuff is engaging enough that you're probably going to have a good time. And like, um, I think Shelby is one of the people who just enjoyed this book. Uh, and like, there was quite a few people who like enjoyed it, but had issues with it. And like all of us, I think me and Will enjoyed it like throughout it more than Katie. Like I wasn't, I know exactly which scene Katie is talking about. And I can absolutely see why by that point you would just be done. But for me, I was still engaged and it was really like, the weird stuff with the weird organization that really I enjoyed reading it I really did again I, I didn't really put it down the whole time I was reading it and like I actually would read it again too probably at some point just because I really enjoy the world and the characters it's just that the f the core of the book is weirdly enough the weakest part of it oh Shelby says I'm a I'm gonna assume you meant sucker I'm a sucker for time loops uh so I listen to it with blinders I love the narration and the atmosphere I just enjoy it and like here's the thing absolutely all of that is fantastic there's so much good here this guy is obviously very talented i would not say like i would not take any of that away from him i do not think i could put together a murder mystery this uh intensely yeah <laughs> like this was this was a lot to track and i i do want to reread it if i would have had time i would have reread it for tonight just so i would have had a clearer idea of how some stuff got put together and then i realized we don't have time to go over how all the stuff got put together, so it doesn't matter. And I think that's it. I would read it. If you like murder mysteries, please yeah. read it. It did make me want to read some Agatha Christie, though. So, guys. <laughs> yeah, it did. I was like... Agatha Christie? Agatha Christie? Agatha Christie? Agatha Christie? In the comments, uh, put down any good uh, murder mysteries that you guys uh, like. Um, you know... It's it's funny because, again, this is not the kind of book we read usually, but I, I did enjoy it. And it was a nice kind of change of pace. And also, uh, join our Patreon. This was so much fun to do with our patrons, honestly. And it's not a book we would have done otherwise. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, let us know. I mean, if you have any further thoughts, our patrons in the Discord, just, you know, you can still do that in the book club uh, channel. It's it's a book that I think it has a lot to talk about. So uh, we will see you all later, our parasocial darlings. Bye.